Okay. This conference will now be recorded. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can see um, the review packet I'm working with. So you should be able to see review packet number, um, let's see, review packet number two, which is a different one than what I've got here. Okay, so Connor's asking about questions 1 and 20. I'll do those really quickly, and then um, I'll look backwards. Uh, sorry, I'll go up the list and see what else is up there, and then I want to answer Corinne's question about the kind of more general ideas of finding theta in a pendulum problem like the one we did in class today. Um, question number one, I did this in one of the classes today. I think it was block 1B. Um, this is a work energy uh, problem. So we have a car that's skidding, um, and the question then is, what happens if we double the mass? So if there's any leftover work, um, it's going to cause a change in kinetic energy. This is one of this is the work energy theorem, and um, you know if I were to make like a free body diagram of this car that's moving to the right, of course we have like a weight vector and a normal force vector going up and a frictional force vector acting to the left, assuming that the velocity is to the right. So friction is the only force that's stopping the car. So I can say then that the work done by the frictional force is the net force. Of course, there's work done by the normal force, but that's zero because it's perpendicular to the direction of motion. Same thing for the, the work done by the weight force or mg, that's zero. And so the only uh, kind of agent that's actually doing work is this frictional force and that's why it produces a net uh, work which causes the the kinetic energy to change so by definition work is defined by uh, the 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 um, dot product of f and d that basically just means fd cosine theta and that's going to cause a change in kinetic energy or i can say you know the kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial so the final kinetic energy is going to be equal to zero, and uh, we know that because it eventually comes to rest. And um, the frictional force, as we can see, um, well, maybe that's not obvious from the sketch just yet. Friction is mu times the normal force. This right here is a fundamental formula on your yellow equation sheet. But the normal force is equal to the weight force. We can see that from the free body diagram. So I can replace this and say that you know friction is equal to mu um, times uh, m, uh, the normal force, which in this case is mg. And it turns out that the cosine of theta, theta in this case is 180 degrees. And the reason is if the object is moving to the right, the frictional force acts to the left. And therefore, it's going to just put a negative sign here in front of that whole thing. And so that negative sign is going to kind of deal with the negative sign over here. I get negative one half uh, mv squared. The, the, the negatives go away, but more importantly, the masses cancel out. And we can see that that has no uh, bearing. By the way, I forgot the d. I just dropped that. f is mu mg. And then I got to remember to uh, multiply that by d. And so uh, distance... Uh, is proportional to the square of the object's speed, but it's it's independent of mass. And so that's where kind of choice B is the correct answer uh, for question number one. Connor, make sure I've answered your question on that one, and then uh, we'll take a look at question number um, question number 20. Um, here's a... Uh, um, question number 20 um, involves this skater at rest. Um, and so, so they're starting at rest, they're on a frictionless rink, and they throw a two kilogram ball, giving the ball a velocity of 10. Um, so if I were to make a sketch of this, um, let me kind of sketch in here what this might look like. So we've got somebody that's standing on this frictionless surface and they're holding a bowling ball here in their hand. And um, this is, uh, and, and 
hopefully um, you guys have identified this. By the way, um, why don't I just take like five or 10 seconds. What kind of a problem is number 20? You can either just kind of like, you know, think it to yourself or if you want to jot it down in the chat box, that's great. What kind of problem are we dealing with here? And then I'll finish this. It's important that you guys kind of go through this ahead of time and classify the type of problem that it is. It ends up being an explosion and uh, the ball goes to the left and the, the subsequent rider and the skateboard go to the right. And the momentum to the right is equal to the momentum to the left. And um, they have equal magnitudes, but opposite directions. Remember that momentum is a vector. So this is equal to MV of the rider. And this is equal to uh, MV of the bowling ball. And so what we're going to do is just kind of plug these, you know, plug these in. What we're, what we're really saying is, um, you know, negative P of the bowling ball plus P of the rider to the right is equal to zero because the initial momentum was zero. As a matter of fact, if I were to like be a little bit more formal about this, I would simply say that the sum of the initial momentum must be equal to the sum of the final um, momentum in the system. And so that's zero. And so zero is equal to the momentum of the ball plus the momentum of the rider after the collision. And so I'm going to subtract the momentum of the ball from both sides and I get negative PB of the ball or the momentum of the ball is equal to the momentum of the rider. And then finally, I can say that MV of the ball, which is to the left, is equal to MV of the rider, which is to the right. And so now I'm just going to plug these things in and finish this problem over here. Um, this becomes... Uh, of the ball is two and this is 10. I'm going to leave units out here to make this easy for me. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, on the right hand side, the mass of the rider is 50 and we're trying to figure out how fast that person goes to the right. So I get 20 over 50 or two fifths of a meter per second. Um, and so it looks like choice B is the correct answer. It's two fifths of a meter per second going to the right, which, you know, is in the opposite direction um, of the ball. Just choice B comes from Connor. Make sure that I've answered question number uh, 20 for you. Um, let me go ahead and do while we're at it. Um, question number 23, uh, which is one that uh, Shani is asking about. And then I'll do Corinne's question. I keep pushing it off. Um, question number 23 involves a rocket. And um, I'm just going to make a sketch here. Um, here's the rocket, and it's getting ready to uh, blast off. Uh, actually, it's not getting ready to blast off. It's already going. Its initial speed here is 12, and its final speed is 36. And, of course, the units are given to us in meters per second. And uh, they give us the weight of the rocket, so we know its mass. Uh, the weight is uh, 15,000 newtons, so its mass, I divide that by G, is 1,500 kilograms. And uh, the thrust force, which is also given to me in the problem, is equal to 24,000 newtons. They just give that number to me in scientific notation. And so they're asking me um, to figure out how much time that would take. And um the the question about time is a bit of a giveaway and that this is an impulse momentum equation um because impulse is really the only concept that incorporates an analysis of time uh work and energy do not and so therefore i'm going to say force times time is equal to my change in momentum which could be written as momentum final mon minus momentum initial uh, alternatively, I can write that as MV final minus MV initial, or I can factor out the M and I get M delta V or, or V final minus V initial. And so um, I'm solving this for time and I have everything that I need. Time is going to be equal to uh, my mass, which is 1500. I'm going to leave the units out uh, so I don't run out of space. Kilograms. My change in velocity is going to be 36 minus 12 or 24 uh, meters per second. I have to divide that by force, uh, which is 24,000 uh, newtons. And um, 
And so that you know, 24 here and the 24 here gives me 1,000 in the denominator. And so I get 1,500 over 1,000 or uh, 1 1.5 seconds. Um, Shawnee, make sure that I've answered your question there with question number 23. Um, Corinne's question um, was about uh, a problem like we did in class. I'm going to make a quick sketch of this so that you guys remember it. This is a good one to keep in your back pocket because uh, you'll see it from time to time in these question banks. The one we did in class today involved, I, you know, two objects. I called this one uh, the hammer because it was like a pendulum, and then it fell down to some lower position, and then um, it hit something. That's not important. In class today, the object was A. The angle theta was given to you as the pendulum angle, the angle between um, the, the kind of normal equilibrium position here uh, of the string in this elevated position. This length uh, here is L. That's the length of the pendulum or um, the length of the string here. This is also L, right? Because it's the same pendulum. We've just kind of um, elevated to some higher position. I'm going to draw your attention to a triangle that I'm going to sketch in in this um, green color. And so this triangle is the one you're going to kind of pay attention to for a bit. And um, the reason is we ultimately want to figure out how fast this object is going when it gets to the lower position. And we need to know what this height H is. So if that's all we're interested in, H, then we should see that this, the side of the triangle, of the green triangle, is the adjacent side. This is the opposite side over here. And so I have a right triangle with a known angle and a known hypotenuse, right? Remember that L is the hypotenuse. So I'm going to make a general statement here. I'm going to say that the cosine of theta, by definition in mathematics, it's the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse side. And I'm just going to abbreviate it, uh, excuse me, abbreviate that as A over L. So really, I've got cosine theta is equal to A over L. And if I multiply both sides by L, I get L cosine theta is equal to the adjacent side. So that's just our starting point. Now I can say, hey, you know, I'm not interested in side A. What I'm really interested in is in finding this height H. And H is equal to L minus A. Well, we've already established this expression for A. So I can say then that H is equal to L minus L cosine theta. Furthermore, I could factor out an L if I wanted to. This would be L times 1 minus cosine theta. And now I have an expression for H that can be used most often in some sort of gravitational potential energy analysis where I have MGH and that gets substituted in for H. And so I get some sort of gravitational potential energy is equal to MG times uh, L times one minus cosine theta. So that would be kind of an example of a, of a pendulum problem where um, your height H is expressed in terms of theta and the length of the pendulum. Make sure, uh, Corinne, that I've answered your question about uh, that, that particular problem. Um, let's see here. I got another question, bear with me. Uh, number seven on packet number two, and then another follow-up question on a, a power problem similar to the ski lift. So let's take a look at question number seven, and then, um, and then we'll go take a look at a ski lift problem. So um, here's question number seven. Um, I, in one of the classes today, it might have been, it might have been two B, but um, we're given a, a question about power, and we're also told that the the car is moving at a constant speed, and so those two together 
um, or a giveaway that this is an application of our standard power equation. Power is a rate, so power is work over time. That's its algebraic representation. Uh, I've been doing this in class lately. About a third of our students are concurrently enrolled in calculus. And so as a function, this would be the time derivative dw dt. This is the time derivative of work or uh, energy. That's just a different way of notating the same algebraic relationship work over time. Let's keep it algebraic. This is an algebra-based physics class. And um, work can be written as force times distance. Now, technically, there is a cosine theta component here. But let's remember that as long as they're in the same direction, that becomes the cosine of zero, which is one. And let's also not forget that in the denominator, we have time. So if you look carefully, you'll see that the distance over time piece can be teased out. And another way of writing that power equation then, uh, if this is in the same direction and it's equal to one, it's going to be force times velocity because velocity is distance over time. So now this form in blue that I've just boxed in becomes really useful for us. And uh, it's not given to you on your yellow equation sheet. It's something that you'll need to um, kind of develop on your own. So um, now um, I've been given the power. I've been given the speed V and I can solve for this um, you know, what they're calling a retarding force acting on the car. If I were to draw a free body diagram, uh, the car's engine is pushing to the right. Of course, there's our usual things for objects moving on a horizontal surface. There's a weight force and there's a normal force. And then there's this, um, this uh, retarding force, this drag force or frictional force, or perhaps a combination of the two that we're just gonna abbreviate with F. But if it's moving at a constant speed, the power, sorry, the, the force supplied by the engine has to be equal in magnitude to this retarding force. And so therefore, that's really what they're asking about. What is the magnitude of the retarding force in the car? That's gonna be equal to this force F. So I just to solve for force F and it's gonna be power over velocity or power over speed um, because it's a scalar quantity. And so this is gonna be um, 24,000 divided by our speed of 30 and um, I'm going to get something around 800. Yep, yeah, that makes sense. So choice A is our correct answer. Um, let me check the um, text log here. This thing kicks my butt. All right. Um, so there's a question about a ski lift problem that we did, I think, in class or it was on maybe on the first review packet, something similar to that. Um, and uh, and then there was a question on FRQ number three. Um, let's take a look at that and see uh, how we're doing. FRQ number three, I think that's the Sojourner uh, Rover problem. We took a look at this, I think, in one of the classes today. It might have been um, either 1B, possibly, or 2, 2B. I'm not sure. Um, so we have this rover, and we're being asked about some things. The first three parts of this, not that they're not worthy of a review, but they are, um, they're, they're not work energy topics, um, which, which is normal. You're not going to find... Uh, an FRQ on your exam that only touches on this kind of one aspect of the curriculum. So here in this section, we can see that it's basically a question about the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Mars. Uh, this is stuff that, that should be reviewed from unit three. We're simply saying that F net is equal to the gravitational force. Um, and then we set uh, Newton's second law, MA, is equal to the Newton's universal law of gravitation, GM1, M2 over D squared. Uh, these M's, the mass of the thing on the planet, um, is irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't affect everything accelerates on the surface of the planet regardless of its mass. However, the mass of the planet is not irrelevant. In this case, it's the mass of Mars. And D is the, the radius of Mars because that's the separating distance between the center of mass of the planet and the center of mass of the object, which is on the surface. So we just plug those numbers in and we get this value of roughly... 0.4 or 40% um, 
of uh, of Earth gravity. Um, and so that's where uh, that's where part A comes from. Part B is then um, a fairly simple question asking about the weight. If we know and if we know G, then we can solve for mg by just plugging in the mass and multiplying it by this smaller uh, acceleration due to gravity. It is interesting to note that the weight of the object, in this case 44 newtons, is less than the weight of the same object on Earth, simply because the gravitational field is weaker there. Part C then goes on to ask about the normal force that the ramp has to supply. Um, it, 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 I think, uh, I gotta be honest, it's just a cool question because in spacecraft, um, you know, I've heard some crazy statistics about really every ounce of weight that you add to the payload uh, ends up costing, you know, either, I think it's literally in the millions of dollars. And so there is an effort to reduce weight to absolutely the bare minimum. And so you can see in this question, they just have to make the ramps strong enough to support the rover and anything extra uh, just, you know, is a complete waste of money. And so in this case, we're going to solve for the normal force. Again, it's dynamics, objects on inclined planes. It's interesting to note that we use the cosine to describe the Y component because we flip-flopped our uh, trig pieces. And, um, and then we just solve for the normal force. It's mg cosine theta. So there's uh, A through C. Let's move on to the more unit force specific parts. Um, D is al almost a trick question. It's saying, hey, what's the net force? This, this would have been a tougher question if they didn't use the word net. Uh, if they just said, how much force does the, does the rover need to travel at a constant speed, then we'd need to know something about the frictional effects, either drag, which is what one of the other questions or portions of the questions asks about. So, um, so that's almost like a trick question. And then, and then we get into the nitty gritty and, and we can see here the relationship between work and energy. Take a look at part E. Um, you know, we know that work and energy uh, not only have the same units, but are, you know, nearly synonymous in their, in, in, uh, you know, work causes a change in energy. And so we can see that here. And so I've just substituted energy in for work. And so we can say that power is equal to energy over time, solving for time, knowing the energy stored in the battery and the power required by the rover, I can calculate how many seconds in totality that this rover can run for 54,000 seconds of course i'd divide that by 60 seconds if i wanted to know how many minutes that was but in this question i know how fast it can go this kind of snail's pace here 6.7 times 10 to the minus 3 so that's 6.7 millimeters per second which isn't that fast times 54,000 seconds and that gives me this number 362 meters that's the total driving distance that the rover can handle. Um, and then finally, this last question invokes something similar to, um, to, to the concept of power that we've touched on earlier. You can see the, um, you know, again, uh, we have this a question about power and an object moving at a constant speed. And so those two things together, it's a question about power, and we know that V is constant, then that kind of brings you to this point here. So we derive this expression for power, it's force times velocity. Uh, we recognize that in our free body diagram, we have a normal force and a weight force, an applied force by the rover and some sort of a drag force, F sub drag, um, acting to the left. And since it's moving at a constant speed, we know that force, the applied force by the rover and the drag force are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So, Therefore, I can say, all right, well, um, this, this, you know, in, the, in my free body diagram, I've called that, you know, this applied force. It's power over velocity. And, um, and so uh, this, this force supplied by the rover has to produce this force, but then we have to produce some extra. We have to, we have to produce enough um, to overcome drag. Actually, I, I kind of misspoke here. That's the total that's produced, but we're saying that 
0.01% of that force is expended against atmospheric drag. They're asking you for the magnitude of the drag force. So I'm just multiplying that really by 0.01%. Since it's percent, I move the decimal place an additional two spots. And so I can figure out the drag force. It's a fraction of a Newton or uh, 0.15. Um, so, so that's question FRQ3. Let's take a look at... Um, you know, an example of a power question um, that you that um, that somebody was asking about. Let me bring up. Um, actually, they were asking about um, like the ski ski chairlift question. Um, let me bring up a, a blank page. I'm just going to open up um, a new document. So let's do this. All right, so I'm just sharing a blank document, and this is weird. I'm just using it for uh, the, literally the white background. So um, in this particular doc, uh, in this particular kind of problem, it's going to be similar to something that we've seen before. So we've got this kind of hill, um, and um, this this you know instead of skiers, um, you know let's move this block. Let's move the block to the top of the hill here. And um, and so we need to be given some information about the hill. Ultimately, we need to know H. And the height above this arbitrary reference plane here that we're calling zero, uh, that height H can be given in a variety of different ways. You could be given the length of the incline and the angle theta, and then be, you know, you'd, you'd have to use trig um, in this case, the sine of theta, right? We know that the sine of theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse, L. And so therefore we get L sine theta is equal to the height in this case. It, it depends on, on what information you're given regarding the, um, you know, regarding the specific problem. And we'd also need to be given the mass in some way of this object that we're moving. Um, in some cases, like the skier problem, you know, we were moving more than one. The skier problem really specifically wanted to know about the power supplied by the chairlift system. In this case, you know, we could ask a similar question. What's the power required to lift this in a certain amount of time? And so power is equal to the rate that work is completed or the rate that energy uh, is, is, is changed. And so the only energy that's changing in this case as we move the box from position one to position two is the gravitational potential energy. So what we could really say is the change in gravitational potential energy per unit time. And so we would need to know, you know some information. Um, we would need to know the change in potential energy is going to be uh, final minus initial. And we could just say that this is going to be MGH final. Now, we're assuming that the initial height is equal to zero, and so therefore it has no potential energy when it starts. Um, and that makes sense. Whenever you're comparing two points in an energy problem, you always call the lower of the two positions zero. That's what you define your reference plane as. And so now um, we still have to keep the, the time piece and the denominator. Keep in mind that um, whatever, the, whatever the energy is here, so it's dependent on mass, it's dependent on the gravitational acceleration on Earth. That's you know obviously 9.8, and it's dependent on the height. <clears throat> so those three factors affect the numerator. But you could you could do the same amount of work, or another way of thinking about that is change the energy of this object from the bottom up to the top. And if you do the same amount of energy in less time, so as the denominator gets smaller that increases the amount of power required to do it. So it's plausible that you could have a situation where you, you're, you're doing the same amount of work, or another way of saying that is you're changing this, the amount of energy, but you do it in a different amount of time, which changes the power requirements. I'm going to stop on that one um, and then um, check in with Livy's question, which is the difference between work and network. Um, 
if I were to to kind of go back to to this you know free body diagram that I've been working with, imagine that I have an object on an inclined plane and it's being um, you know accelerated up the incline, and so there's going to be some force F here, and uh, there's going to be a weight force going down. There's going to be a normal force uh, acting up, and then let's say that there's a small frictional force here to the left. So each one of these agents, that's a fancy nerd word for forces, each one of these things, these forces, does work. So there's work done by this force F, and that's going to be equal to uh, FD cosine theta. It's accelerating up the incline. So this is going to be the cosine of zero, which is one. So it's going to be F times D. Um, it's The point isn't to kind of get numbers here. The point is to show principles. Though there's work done by the normal force, which is equal to the normal force times this distance d that it moves, whatever that distance d is, times the cosine of theta. But this time, theta is 90 degrees, and so it doesn't matter what the normal force is. It doesn't matter what d is. The normal force does no work because of that perpendicular relationship uh, or that angular uh, displacement between the normal force and the displacement. The, f the work done by friction is uh, interesting. It's going to be the frictional force times D times the cosine of theta. But in this case, theta is 180 degrees, so it's going to be negative 1. And so that's going to give us some sort of negative number for the work done by friction. All of these things are doing work. And then lastly, perhaps most interestingly, um, the work done by the weight force Mg or W is going to be Mg uh, D times the cosine of the angle theta, except this time uh, for this one, theta is the angle between the direction of motion, which is here represented by that red line, and the direction of the weight force. So it's going to be the uh, complement to the angle of inclination. This is theta, so we're going to have to subtract 180 from theta in order to get this angle. Let's call it beta, which is what we would use here in the work equation. <clears throat> and since it's greater than 90 degrees, what that tells us, it's going to be a negative number. That's all that that tells us. It's going to be negative. The gravitational force, mg, does negative work. So Livy's question is, what's the difference between work and network? Well, you know, simply stated, we're just going to add up all of these things here. Whatever that is, zero, we're adding a negative, which is the same as subtracting, adding a negative, same as subtracting. Then we're going to be left with something. And whatever that is, it's going to be positive. And the reason that I know that is because we were told that it accelerates up the incline. And so anytime that something is accelerating, um, we're going to have a leftover work or a network. And that's going to cause a change in the kinetic energy of the object. It's getting faster, right? Kinetic energy, by definition, UK is equal to one half mv squared. So if the mass isn't changing, then that means that the speed is increasing or it's accelerated. Um, I've answered a few people's questions uh, here. Um, Dominic is asking about question number 21 on packet number two. Are there follow-up questions um, to the general discussion about the skier problem? In this case, I just made it a box. Or Livy's question about the difference between work and network. Corinne asked about the derivation of work energy theorem and impulse momentum. No, I think they're good ideas to be familiar with. Um, I mean, I know that's such a teacher thing to say. You're like, give me a break. Tell me what I need to know for the test. But, you know, um, sometimes it's, it, uh, bear with me here, it's elegant to know the origins of some of these formulas. They don't just kind of appear out of thin air. You guys are capable enough and experienced enough to know that they come from things that you already are familiar with. So the goal there was to show you, I think that they are accessible. Um, a second year AP physics course does require you to know those kinds of derivations. And so the thinking is that you understand physics on a more granular level. So the short answer, Corinne, is no. Um, you don't know, need to know those derivations um, for work energy and pulse momentum. Um, Question number 21 on packet number two. Let's go back uh, to packet number two. 
All right, let's take a look at 21. And I think that'll be a good place um, to stop. So question number 21 um, is here. This is Dominic's question. Uh, a certain particle undergoes erratic motion. So immediately um, everybody is like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and and that just means that that uh, it's not a predictable it's not a it's not a predictable motion it doesn't have a constant acceleration it might be going to the left uh, sorry going to the right and then turn around come to the left go back to the right and its velocity might be increasing and decreasing anyway so it's erratic at every point in its motion the direction of the particle's momentum um, and and that's just understanding the the vector direction of momentum has to be since it's it's dependent on mass which is a scalar and velocity which is a vector it's dependent on uh the direction of velocity and so it would be impossible for the particle whatever its instantaneous velocity is imagine it's up and to the right for a second then if that's the direction of its velocity its momentum must also then be up and to the right because of that dependency um, I think I'm going to wrap up there unless somebody has a one last burning question uh, from the review packets. I'll give you guys 20 seconds to think about that. All right, guys. Oh, layout of the test, Marika. Good question. Uh, good place to end, too. Um, the layout of the test, I haven't looked at it in the last 48 hours, but I did look at it last week. Um, and so I'm approximating here roughly 20 to uh, 24 at the very most, but probably closer to 20 multiple choice questions and two, uh, no more than three FRQs, but probably two. So it's a standard format. It's worth 100 points. Uh, which is larger than the unit three, which is worth 56, um, and slightly less than the unit two, which is worth 108. So uh, that's the plan. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I don't have time tomorrow before uh, school, but I do have time tomorrow during 1A, and you can find me in the library in 3A if you do have questions. Thanks, guys. That's it for tonight. Have a good night.